Hi, everybody. Dr. Daniel. And today I'm talking about let's work on those weekend migraines. Well, migraine headaches come and go. Many times they just come out of the blue for no reason at all, but at other times it's that dinner you missed the night before when you came home exhausted from a draining work schedule and you just went to bed. Or those two margaritas you had for supper at that New Mexican food restaurant to celebrate the end of the week. Or maybe it was the late breakfast and mid-morning jogging you did on a Sunday, Saturday morning, straight out of bed, and the hot shower you took after your exercise. Many headaches all have well-known triggers that set them off, and the same is true for your Saturday morning migraines. So Saturday morning migraine, what causes them? The cause of Saturday morning migraines is multifactorial, like a hit list of migraine triggers, and the possible causes are oversleeping, alcohol, withdrawal from stress, heat, sun, workout headache, eating regularly, caffeine withdrawal, and humidity and dehydration. Well, let's talk about those separately. Oversleeping. Why does oversleeping result in a migraine headache? Migraine is intimately related to our inner biologic cycle, especially our diurnal sleep-wake cycle. Sleep experts advise seven to eight hours of sleep every night for most persons, like adults, not children or youngsters. If someone has a job and needs to be in the office working by 9 a.m., they'll need to be set up a daily set time of getting up in the morning at 7 to 8 in the morning. And then if that person normally goes to sleep by 10 or 11 p.m., they may obtain their required amount of sleep with that schedule. If this sleep allowance is not kept, then there will be problems, especially for the unfortunate migraine brain person who has inherited, inherited a very special sensitive brain that reacts to changes in sleep, heat, stress, estrogen levels, all sorts of medications like caffeine, and degree of hydration. Oversleeping several hours on a Saturday morning distorts the migraine brain's sleep cycle and can set off the start of a migraine headache. It is to be avoided if possible. There's a long written history of missed sleep aggravating migraine. Standard textbooks on our headache have traditionally noted a relationship between sleep and migraine. Diamond and Delasio, writing in their textbook called The Practicing Physician's Approach to Headache in 1982, 1982 list oversleeping as a factor for migraine. Likewise, Saper et al., writing the textbook Handbook of Migraine Management in 1999, state that sleep too much or too little is a potential provoking factor of migraine. Matthew, writing on headache and sleep in Headache, the journal in 1987, stated, Patients with chronic, intractable, predominantly nocturnal headaches appear to have a high instance of sleep abnormalities compared with normal persons. Perlman, writing in 2002 in The Spectrum of Migraine, stated, quote, Sleep patterns are often valuable... Let me say, sleep patterns are often variable in adolescent lifestyle, and sleep pattern changes often trigger or exacerbate migraine. Sleep deprivation, as in this case, is a frequent trigger in children and adolescents. Regular sleep routines can often reduce headache frequency. Calhoun and Ford, writing in 2007 in On Behavioral Sleep Modification, may revert transform migraine to episodic migraine. It stated that sleep problems have been linked with headaches for more than a century, but whether the headaches are the cause or the result of the disrupted sleep is unknown. Sleep has a powerful effect on migraine, and the rules for living with it are patients should set their sleep cycle to get up in the morning and go to bed every day at the same time, even through the weekend. Bedtime and rise time should not vary more than half an hour from day to day. Do not keep two sleep schedules. 
one for the week where you're working and the other one for the weekend where you're time off. Try to get seven, eight hours sleep every night and stay in bed at least, but not more than eight hours. Patients should not watch television, read, work, or listen to music on the radio in bed. Avoid oversleeping Saturday morning or falling asleep for that seductive two-hour nap on Sunday afternoon. This may incubate a migraine. If you get an early morning migraine close to the time you normally awaken, try to stay up and do not go back to sleep. Patients should eat dinner at at least four hours before bedtime and to limit fluids within two hours of bedtime so they don't get up and go to the bathroom. Patients should stop all naps, even if they feel tired or drowsy during the day, to help them consolidate the next night's sleep. So a nap will rob you of sleeping at night. Careful attention to all these sleep ideas will help you with oversleeping migraine. And the clinical pearl here is get up at the same time every day. Okay, alcohol. Alcohol is well known to aggravate a migraine headache. I previously wrote in a different blog article on is alcohol a migraine trigger? And I'm going to quote from that. Alcohol is commonly stated to be a trigger by many patients and accepted by many doctors. Control studies regarding consumption of alcohol triggering migraine are mostly positive for red wine. There are confusing results that limit the relationship with other forms of alcohol. Older personal non-scientific statements are not to be trusted as much as newer, more carefully constructed scientific research studies. But one of the earliest references connecting migraine and alcohol was made by Celsius, who lived 25 B.C. to 50 A.D. He said, quote, The pain is contracted by drinking wine, end quote. Another earlier statement was made by Paul of Agena in about 625 through 690 A.D. when he lived, who commented on the relationship between drinking wine and the occurrence of migraine. Paulus Agenta described migraine from, quote, drinking of wine, end quote. It's been thought that certain chemicals in alcohol, such as tyramine and histamine, act in the brain to set off a migraine headache. Who educates and writes about migraine and alcohol? Well, the National Headache Foundation, the American Headache Society, and many migraine websites and doctors who write on migraine advocate attention to alcohol factors to avoid migraine and often provide a list of tools and foods and chemicals that are suspected of doing this. However, the whole question of migraine worsened by various foods is controversial and confusion and confusing. What do expert neurologists who write about migraines say? Well, Lance, the famous Australian neurologist who first wrote about ice pick headache, wrote in 1955, quote, my patients with special food triggers have the same number of migraine attacks when they avoid triggers as before. The only thing on which they agreed is that alcohol precipitates attacks specifically red wine. Otherwise, I think the question of dietary migraine is very suspect. Clinical pearl. If you get a headache from alcohol, watch out, especially red wine. Withdrawal from stress. Freedom from stress, the letdown weekend, holiday, or vacation headache, they're called migraines that come after stress. Withdrawal from stress is a migraine activating factor, which is just the opposite of applied stress and is paradoxical in many ways. The reaction is poorly understood and likely related to multiple neurochemical changes in the brain resulting and relating to stress. One possible mechanism is that the stress hormone adrenaline is secreted in our bodies when we are stressed, whether we want or know it. A cue to adrenaline secretion might be slight increase in the resting pulse or blood pressure. All week long, during the daily stress of work and family, adrenaline is secreted secretly in the body, and one of the things it does is cause cerebral arterial vasoconstriction. Then on the weekend, where there's more unstructured time often and a different schedule, the patient may stay up late on Saturday night getting their sleep-wake cycle out of sync 
and they may eat irregularly or have an alcoholic beverage with dinner Saturday night. On Sunday, the patient oversleeps. The pituitary adrenal axis slows down, resulting in a bad migraine Sunday morning because of adrenaline withdrawal, the alcohol, and because of oversleeping. Also, for many Americans, Sunday may be a stressful time, even though there may be no active office-type work. The lack of structure in the weekend days can result in arguments over issues that would not be approached during the busy week. That's the time to work things out. And there's then Sunday evening, the mind unconsciously anticipates the return to regular work week schedule and tension may arise. The clinical pearl here is keep stress levels steady and constant. All right, heat, sun, workout headache. The relationship of heat, sun, and working out with migraine has not been studied statistically, but most most surveys of migraine patients mention it. None of the headache textbooks I consulted discussed it, but it's all over the internet if one Googles migraine and heat or migraine in the sun. Consider that exposure to heat, sun, or working out makes the individual red in the face or somewhat flushed. All the tiny blood vessels in the face are vasodilated following response to heat, the sun, or working out. And the same thing happens inside the skull to the cerebral arteries. Cerebral vasodilatation and trigeminal activation are the heart of migraine and clues to our understanding of what's going on in the brain with headache. There may be more subtle changes in the brain from small increases also in core body temperature, which promotes migraine. Other conditions to watch out for are a hot shower, a bright sunlight, glancing off the surface of water, a mirror, or the surface of a car hood insignia, which may set off a migraine. Some migraine patients get a workout headache if they get hot. If this happens with exercise, then change to workout in a cool environment so you do not get so hot. Exercise inside of a in front of a fan or an air conditioning area to jog on a treadmill or rather than out in the hot July sun jogging. Take ibuprofen, Excedrin, or half of a tryptin drug before you work out, and sometimes that'll prevent a headache coming. But limit that to only two days a week. If you still get a workout headache, then try a sport that doesn't raise the body temperature, like swimming. A general rule regarding exercise it is that if a migraine has already started, then exercise should be avoided. However, in some patients, migraine may be stopped by exercising. On the other side of the issue, aerobic exercise is good for migraine occurrence for anxiety disorders, panic attacks, depression, tension-type headache, and sleep problems. There are many articles in the last 30 years on the value of aerobic exercise for migraine. Not just health, it's good for health mainly, but it also helps migraine. Clinical pearls. Do not get too hot. Avoid the sun. Get good sunglasses. Take a lukewarm bath. Okay, next is eating regularly. The pituitary gland is the master gland at the base of the brain, which in response to brain signals, monitors all the endocrine glands in the human body. That is, the pituitary gland controls the production of insulin in the pancreas, production of adrenaline and cortisol in the adrenal gland, and the production of thyroid hormone in the thyroid gland. The pituitary gland is well served by arteries and veins, so it can sense the flow of the chemicals in the bloodstream coursing through the body. The pituitary gland continuously monitors the amount of glucose in the bloodstream and then either shuts off insulin production if the blood sugar is too low or turns on insulin production if the blood sugar is too high. The pituitary gland response to a low blood sugar, usually less than 50, sends out a hormonal signal that can cause vasodilatation of the cerebral arteries in the start of what's called a hungry headache, which is usually a dull, throbbing headache in the temples or a full-blown migraine. And in other words, the side here is you treat a hungry headache by feeding it little joke there. Because of this fact and because of one of the problems with migraine patients is they have a sensitive brain to numerous triggers. And because a low blood sugar is a reliable and frequent migraine trigger, migraine patients should eat regularly. Where I grew up, that meant one ate three meals a day. But interviewing many migraine patients has convinced me that not everyone heard that message 
particularly young girls or teenagers. They do not like to hear me say that breakfast means to break the fasting of sleep. When I suggest they eat three meals a day, these young ladies look at me with a shock of disbelief as if I'd asked them to listen to the Kings and Trio, my favorite folk group in the 60s. Yet I persist with my advice. If they did not eat anything for breakfast, I find it helpful to then document when they do eat. When is lunch? What time is dinner? If the evening meal is 6 p.m. and they eat lunch at 12 noon, I'll calculate out loud that they've gone 18 hours without eating so they may consider the number of hours they routinely go with no food in their brain, in their stomachs. Can you drive your car with an empty tank, I'll ask. When they sneer and suggest that they miss a meal a day to lose weight, I point out that none of the successful weight loss organizations, such as Jenny Craig and Weight Watchers, recommend missing meals. I look them in the eye and tell them that persons who miss meals tend to max out, or one may say pig out, when they finally do eat. I rarely hear a reply to that statement. Everyone knows it's true in their hearts. When they tell me they do not have time to eat in the morning because missing breakfast is the main meal missed, I respond that migraine patients need to organize their lives carefully the night before so they're not, they are prepared in the morning to live their lives in a slower, calmer fashion rather than rushing around everywhere. And remember, the Boy Scout motto is, Be prepared. Cornelius Celsius, living 25 B.C. through 50 A.D., was an advisor to the emperor Tiberius and Caligula, who became a Roman encyclopedist. He lived in Gallia Narbonensis, and his only surviving work, the De Re Medicina, was probably part of a much larger encyclopedia and was the source of information regarding diet, pharmacy, and surgery. Pierce stated that, Quote, it is sometimes said that there's only one great Roman book on medicine, De Re Medicina. Celsius recognized migraine and some of its causes. So he said, quote, a long weakness of the head, but neither severe nor dangerous through the whole life. Sometimes the pain is more violent, but short, not fatal, which is contracted by drinking wine or crudity or cold or heat of a fire or the sun. And all these pains are sometimes accompanied by a fever and sometimes not. Sometimes they affect the whole head or other times a part of it. End of quote. It's generally accepted that fasting can produce a migraine attack. Living described fasting as an aggravating factor for migraine in 19... I'm sorry, 1793, and Pierce induced moderately severe hypoglycemia by insulin in patients with migraine, and only two develop an attack. Rose, writing on food and headache and headache quarterly in 1997, stated that there's a slight decrease in the level of serum glucose a few hours after beginning a fast. It goes from 3.3 to 3.9 millimoles per liter. However, the cause because gluconeogenesis and a decrease in glycogen synthesis occurs, unless hepatic glycolysis occurs, there is no hypoglycemia. This result occurs because of a fall in insulin level, a rise in glucagon level, and increased sympathetic activity. These findings indicate that while missing meals may be a trigger for migraine attacks, it's not simply the fall in serum glucose level that's responsible, in it quotes. So the clinical pearl here is eat three meals every day. Eat something. Next is caffeine withdrawal. Caffeine is a drug. It's addictive. It's the number one drug that causes medication overuse headache in America. If caffeine is not consumed at the same time, rebound headache occurs. Most people like to drink it. This is an important thought to be considered and remembered. Caffeine is in our coffee, our tea, our cola, our over-the-counter headache medicine like Excedrin, and our chocolate. Caffeine is ubiquitous. The grocery store in Dallas, where I live, has a Starbucks outlet inside the store and then another big standalone Starbucks restaurant down the street in the same block. Eight ounces of regular coffee has 135 milligrams of caffeine, but one Starbucks eight-ounce latte has 250 milligrams of caffeine. In my office, I have a question on the patient registration form that asks how many caffeine drinks a day the patient takes. 
doing quick, simple math, I can estimate total caffeine content. Four brewed coffees would be four times 135 equal 540, and three Cokes, which is three times 35, 135, and you add that together, you get 675 milligrams of caffeine a day, a patient may say to me, which is usually for dietary, recreation, or social reasons. Uh, it's also because I can't get going in the morning without my caffeine. I have to have my coffee. I get a headache if I don't do that. All right, so caffeine is absorbed within 30 to 60 minutes after drinking a cup of coffee, and its effects last from four to six hours. Pharmacologically, caffeine acts as a central nervous system stimulator at the point that's well made by the caffeine ads on TV, which call it the think drink. Caffeine speeds up reaction time and improves automatic processing skills like doing arithmetic problems and proofreading says author Stephen Braun. But for more complicated tasks like complex word problems, caffeine has also been shown to worsen performance. John J. Barone, who tracks caffeine consumption at the Coca-Cola Company in Atlanta, reports that the average American adult drinks about 200 milligrams of caffeine a day, while the top 10% take an average of 400 milligrams a day. The typical American drinks about two cups of coffee a day, although the peak of caffeine intake in 1962 was three cups of coffee a day, and that was typical. Smoking cigarettes removes caffeine from the blood twice as fast as those who do not smoke, and this, in fact, may account for the fact that smokers drink more caffeine. The approximate breakdown in terms of source of caffeine is coffee is 75%, tea 10%, cola is 10%, and chocolate 2%. Many persons feel nervous or anxious with as little as 200 milligrams of caffeine. Since the duration of the effect of the drug is four to six hours, if one goes to bed at 11 p.m., then the last drink of coffee or caffeine should be no later than 5 p.m. Otherwise, you won't go to sleep. Caffeine also acts as a constrictor of smooth muscle, which is found in arteries, the bladder, and the colon. It's the arterial vasoconstrictive action which helps with mild migraine headache, like from Excedrin, Anison, and BP, BC powders. And that may lead to rebound vasodilatation headache when one withdraws some caffeine too quickly. The smooth muscle effect also acts as a mild stimulant on the bladder, promoting urination and in the colon, a bowel movement. Caffeine can aggravate migraine, anxiety, panic attack, tremor, panic, dis- panic disorder, tremor, cardiac problems, gastric reflux, and insomnia. Caffeine can make you sick if you stop it after taking too much or by just taking too much. The headache patients that I see are commonly confused by the amounts of caffeine, thinking it either treats or causes headaches. Caffeine can do both, but in general, I suggest virgin, unadulterated cerebral arteries not getting their daily hit of caffeine. Yes, I advise my migraine patients to get off of caffeine. Good luck with that. Caffeine is a drug, and after prolonged daily use, if the caffeine is abruptly stopped or reduced in amount significantly, then the patient suffers headache followed by one or more of the following symptoms. So if you stop caffeine, you may feel fatigue, drowsiness, anxiety, depression, nausea, vomiting, clinically significant distress, or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. The diagnostic criteria for caffeine intoxication are recent consumption of caffeine in excess of 250 milligrams a day and the development of five or more of the following signs during or shortly after caffeine use. A person may develop restlessness, nervousness, excitement, insomnia, a flushed face, diuresis, gastrointestinal disturbance, muscle twitching, rambling flow of thought and speech, tachycardia or cardiac arrhythmia, periods of inexhaustibility or psychomotor agitation. Caffeine may delay sleep onset, which means that if a person on caffeine, it takes them longer to then fall asleep. It may also interfere with rapid eye movement, sleep, and dreaming. Patients routinely taking caffeine-containing medications have more trouble falling asleep at night than those who take no caffeine. Caffeine helps absorb other drugs in the stomach, and that's the reason why Excedrin has caffeine and aspirin in it. Caffeine alone may act as a mild painkiller, but together with aspirin, 
acetaminophen or ibuprofen may potentiate the analgesic effect. The old pre-tryptan era acute migraine treatment drug, Cafergot, had caffeine and ergotamine in it for the same reason. Another problem with caffeine is that companies that sell it do not put the amount of caffeine on the label of their products, so the unwitting consumer does not know how much is he's getting and consuming. Americans finally know the amount of cholesterol, fat, trans fat, and salt in most foods, but the amount of caffeine is still a hidden trade secret. Even caffeinated water, an incredible that there is such a thing as caffeinated water, does not say how much caffeine is in it. And I have a list. Um, you can see I have a blog article in this subject on um, weekend headaches. And it talks about the amount of caffeine and drinks and stuff. I'm just go through some of these. Um, Jolt has 711 milligrams of caffeine. Anison has 65. Coca-Cola, 12 ounces, 35. Uh, Mountain Dew is the highest pop. It has 55 milligrams. Um, chocolate or cocoa has 5 milligrams. Even there's caffeinated water here. So note that gourmet decaf coffees such as Starbucks have twice as much caffeine as a non-gourmet coffee. So even drinking decaf drinks will still expose many persons to a considerable amount of caffeine. Migraine patients should decaffeinate themselves either quickly, in which case they're likely to suffer a headache and other withdrawal symptoms, or by slowly tapering down, such as decreasing by one cup of coffee or one cola every three days. Patients with medication abuse headache should generally decaf quickly under doctor's care with other medications to help control headache. Sadly, I must also report the obvious containing caffeine, the chemistry of Chocolate is complicated. It also contains tyramine, theobromine, and phenylethylene, which may also have a mild effect on the brain. So the clinical pearl here is, <clears throat> excuse me, caffeine is addictive. It commonly drives migraine headaches. Okay, last little subject here, humidity and hydration. Humidity is defined by the amount of water in the environment. I remember well the sticky, hot, humid summer mornings in Galveston, Texas, where I lived five years during medical school and internship. Humidity can be sensed in our bodies and may be a migraine trigger for some. Hydration refers to imbibing water or fluid into our bodies. Infants and seniors are especially sensitive to a degree of hydration. Thinking of watching football or t- tennis players pausing to drink Gatorade or their favorite sport drink on the sidelines for going back into the game. We all need to consider proper hydration, but especially migraineurs. Clinical pearls here. Do not exercise or do yard work when it's too humid and keep that water bottle nearby to avoid hydration. So that's the end of my talk today. I hope it's helpful to you folks. Please click on like down there. Thanks for listening, and I will see you again on another talk.